Welcome to Truth and Reason. My name is Chris Kramer with the Northside Church of Christ in Russellville, Kentucky. We invite you to worship with us every Sunday morning at 9 and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. We meet at 689 North Main Street in Russellville. And if you're familiar with Russellville, then you probably know where Kentucky Fried Chicken is. They're right next door to our building. We invite you to come and bring your Bibles. And let's study God's Word together. We thank you for listening to our program this evening as we come to you every uh, Sunday evening at 5 o'clock on our YouTube channel. We have various studies throughout the week, and if you're watching this program, then you're probably familiar with our regular scheduled programs. And uh, don't forget our Bible Talks program on Saturday morning. And if you have any Bible questions that you would like answered, just let us know. You can contact us, Northside Church of Christ at hotmail.com. We'd be happy to address your questions on a program like this. We'll just give you a call and we can study the Bible over the phone through computer like Zoom or better yet, let's meet face to face and let's study God's word together and let's uh, encourage each other in the truth of the gospel. As we search for truth and reason, one of our resources we've been using lately is the letters that Peter wrote. And we are covering First Peter and we have been for a while and we will for a while yet because there's a lot of great information and a topical theme as we go through each little section of Peter's writings. And we're going to begin tonight with 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 13 through 17 and talk about the Christian and government. Government is always a, a hot topic, you might say, especially in our society today. Well, we just want to look at what the Bible has to say about it and show what our attitude should be as Christians in our world today. Because God has made it very clear that the governments that are ordained, if you will, are by his design. And that's simply talking about the organization of government, the protection that government provides uh, for men, and um, it is for the protection of the Christian as well. And if you go back and look in Bible times, you'll find that God used local governments in order to uh, allow Christians to have the freedoms to, you know, carry out the word of God. But we'll look at uh, we'll look at occasions as well as to where the government sometimes wanted to put a stop uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and uh, we'll look at how the Christians dealt with that problem as well. Though our main text is coming from First Peter chapter two verses thirteen through seventeen, we can't ignore Romans thirteen one through seven and various other passages in the scriptures. So let's get right to our study. In First Peter chapter two thirteen uh, through seventeen, let's go ahead and just read that text in its entirety, and then we'll go back and look at some details of it. He says here, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors, or as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor the people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. So, as I said a moment ago, Romans 13 is a passage that's very similar to what Peter writes here. It almost makes you think that maybe Paul and Peter collaborated sometimes. <laughs> and I say that jokingly, but we know that they were both apostles of the Lord. They were both given divine inspiration by God. It would only stand to reason that the apostles would uh, write many of the similar things. And especially when it comes to government. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, Paul the Apostle tells the people, the church in Rome, of all places, uh, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. I'm just going to stop there for a moment and just, you know, take it in of the fact that here Paul the Apostle would, you know, eventually plead his case uh, to Rome, to Caesar, 
And if anything, he knew that there would be a certain amount of protection that he would receive, even from a you know, worldly government, a government that did not regard God. And it's ironic that a lot of the trials and tribulations that he had actually came from what we might call you know, religious people. But um, Paul was one that knew how to use the, the laws of the land, if you will, uh, for that protection. And before the Jews could do anything to really hurt him, he appealed to Caesar. And he knew he had a right to do so as a Roman citizen. And it got him out of a few scrapes along the way. And, of course, it, uh, it was all about justice. And so Paul here, he isn't praising the government. He isn't praising Caesar. He isn't praising an, an ungodly uh, organization. But he's saying these things are in place because of God. And we are not going to defy uh, God's organization here. But we should never defy the laws of God. That's going to be the theme throughout this whole study. That's what we need to remember the most. But getting back to our reading here, and I forgot where I le left off actually, but uh, we'll pick up with about verse 5 where it says, Therefore you must be subject, uh, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake, for because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So that kind of gives you a little more insight, I believe, to even what Peter is saying back in our regular text. So if you want to go back there for just a moment, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and beginning in verse 13 as we begin to look at the submission that we are to have as Christians toward those uh, in, uh, in authority. It says again, Therefore submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. It's important that we stop there for just a moment so we can make a distinction in regard to what the ordinance of man is. Ordinance simply means institution in this particular case. And when God ordains an institution, when he ordains a certain type of government, it may be a monarchy like a king. It may be, um, you know, as we have, um, you know, the vote of the people and democracy in the United States of America, whatever it may be, these things are there for our protection. Wherever you might live, wherever you might be listening to this lesson, you may not like your form of government. You may not like its organization. You may always say, as most people do, there's always a better way of doing things. It's not that God has placed every single position um, you know, by his, by his wisdom and by his knowledge to say, oh, we need this councilman here. We need this lawmaker here. And, and you know, the list goes on and on. But he's talking about an organization that protects man. He's not talking about a world that is in chaos. He's talking about organization here. And he's left it up to man as to how he's going to carry out that organization. But what we're talking about overall is what God has ordained as an institution. And I want to focus on the term, the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake. When I look at something that says, for the Lord's sake, I think that means according to his will. Um, and when the government disobeys God, well, that's not according to his will, is it? And so when do we defy government? And that's something that's very, you know, dangerous to talk about. But let's just go over to Acts chapter 5 as we look at verses 40 and 42. And really, it begins at the beginning of the chapter, but for sake of time, we won't be able to read it all. But here you see the disciples going about preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, when they're brought before, you know, the higher authorities, you might say, they are instructed not to teach in the name of Christ. And uh, granted, this was probably more of a located type of government when you look at the Jews and their authority over, you know, their immediate realms. Um, we're not talking about the Roman Empire as a whole here. That will come into play later. But there were those that had a certain amount of authority, you know, among the Jews themselves especially where religious matters and local law was concerned. And then in Acts chapter 5, about verse um, 27 and following, it says, When they had brought them, they set them before the council. The high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And of course, um, you know, the voice of reason had to speak up. Gamaliel, uh, prominent among the Pharisees, says, look, if they're of God, there's, there's nothing we can do here. If they're not of God, 
you know, you send them on their way, they're, they're going to fall on their face, basically. You know, they'll be proven for the false teachers that maybe they are. So, you know, he had a certain amount of wisdom in regard to how to handle the situation because these people were kind of in a, you know, rock and a hard place, you might say, in regard to the fact that people were listening to them. And if they just came right out and opposed the apostles, uh, they were going to have a hard time with the people as well. So they were definitely playing politics here and trying to uh, give an even balance. But um, what eventually happened was, is you know, they still are teaching and preaching in the name of the Lord. And so um, what they did was uh, they called for the apostles. This is in verse 40. They beat them and commanded them again. They should not speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. But look at verse 41 and 42. This is the key point of our passage in Acts chapter 5. It says, So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. You know, I'm very fortunate, uh, as I said before, uh, the comforts of life and whatnot where I'm, where I'm from. But um, uh, I've never had anyone oppose me or stop me from preaching and teaching the gospel. And, uh, you know, we've talked about some elements of this before, back when COVID started and, you know, there were mandates around the world of, you know, no gatherings and things like that. And we found ways to work around that, granted, but we were all learning. We didn't exactly know what to do. And, um, but nobody ever tried to stifle us from teaching and preaching the gospel. And, um, and so I've always had a hard time with people trying to use these verses to say they were under government oppression or whatnot. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some places in the world that probably did experience that. I've heard some very interesting stories. But ultimately, it comes down to this. Uh, I've never been to a place where I wasn't allowed to teach the gospel. And granted, I could hop on a plane and go to certain parts of the world today where certain Christians would have to meet in secret but uh, they still meet, and they still find a way. Even in the times when God's people were taken into bondage from Jerusalem and dragged over to Babylonia, uh, or Babylon, what you find there is they still found a way to worship and pray unto God. It got a few in trouble, like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, but yet, you know, these people still found a way to worship God, though they could not be, um, you know, at their home in Jerusalem and be able to carry out worship at the temple and um, there are those throughout history that have tried to hinder the teaching of Jesus Christ so we're not ignorant of such things but um, we, we, we need to look at passages like this and say look if my government disobeys God if he disobey if it disobeys him in a moral standard in a standard of allowing or disallowing the gospel to be preached then I might have to take some action it's not about rising up against the government. It's not about starting our own commune. It's not about, um, you know, taking up arms or refusal, you know, to uh, to pay taxes and whatnot. Um, you know, it, it's about behaving as a Christian as you should, regardless of your circumstances. Uh, because granted, you know, whatever neighborhood you live in, you look around you, there are worldly people that are there. And what do you do? You, you you mind your own business. You, you tend to your home. You tend to your friends and your family and your churches. And you do what God would have you do, even though your neighborhood doesn't agree with you. Even though uh, there are many around you that you go to the store and you shop around all those and where you have to hear and see worldliness all the time. You pick and choose the things that influence you in your life. And nobody makes us uh, follow false idols. Nobody makes us turn away from God. And um, that being the case, you behave as a Christian wherever you might be. Now, granted, if your governments, you know, allow a lot of sin, like my government certainly does when it comes to, um, you know, issues of society and immorality, yes, homosexuality is a problem. Yes, abortion is a problem. These sins, fortunately, are not things that I am mandated to partake of. And, um, you know, we do know Christians that maybe conduct business uh, in our society today uh, who are being forced in some ways to, um, you know, conduct business with organizations that uh, they have a moral and spiritual opposition against. And, um, you know, they have to deal with those things, you know, as individuals. And, uh, but they, you know, they don't have to defy government, you might say. 
Uh, they don't have to cause an uprising. It may mean in some place, you know, cases that I need to give up a business if I'm being coerced or forced to do something that's ungodly. It may mean that I have to change my profession. Um, it, it may mean that I may have to just fight a battle along the way if I want to keep that business and stand, stand my ground. There may be consequences to those things as well. And as unjust as it may seem or be in the world today, um, never go and never compromise with the worldliness, never compromise with the immorality uh, of the world. You know, if, if you go back to David's time, uh, one thing that he constantly said about Saul, who was not a good ruler, in fact, he was a ruler that God had put in place and warned the people, this is the kind of men you're going to get if you demand a king. But David always called Saul God's anointed, where some people wanted to kill Saul and assassinate him. David said, no, we don't touch him. Uh, he is He's the Lord's anointed. The Lord will take care of this thing. And he always respected the office. That's a term that we often like to use as Christians, to respect the office, respect the ordination of those things. You may, li- li- you may not like the individuals that are in office. And, uh, you know, their time will come. Uh, their time will come. And uh, there'll be sometimes a mess that, that, you know, is laid in the wake of some people's administrations. Just look at the kings uh, from the divided kingdom on uh, in your Old Testaments. Um, You had a king that would rise up and try to restore worship, and then just a generation later, it all fall apart again. And there were more bad kings than there were good kings, and they left things a mess. And God allowed man to make his own decisions along the way. Uh, God had an integral part in some of those things for a particular reason, but for the most part... You know, he couldn't control a man being good or bad. He gave them the consequences. He gave them, uh, you know, certain punishments for their actions. Uh, But ultimately, you'll find that, you know, God has always lifted up to men to do as he wanted to do. And men have messed things up. And if we could say, you know, well, a lot of people like to say, why does God allow such a thing? Well, what would you like God to do? Do you want God to just make us be good all the time? You want God to make the the good leaders to stand up and and always do things in a godly way? Well, you know, he tried that. And if you think about Jesus Christ, how many people stood with our good Lord and Savior? You know, this just goes to show you the stubbornness of man. If God made everybody good that served in any kind of kingdom or government authority, uh, quite frankly, the people still wouldn't follow them. And that's the people's fault. It's not God's fault. Don't you ever blame God because your government isn't going well. Don't ever look at God and say, why would God allow such a thing? It's men that allow such a thing. And God has allowed man to have free will. And if God took away that free will, well, man would be crying about that as well. So folks need to get over that. And they need to serve the God that gives them the blessings and the righteousness of his will and has done everything in his power to give us hope to the point that he allowed his son to die upon the cross, that we may have remission of our sins. That's the kind of God that we need to be serving. That's the kind of God that we do serve. When a ruler is bad, well, you respect the office. doesn't mean you have to like the person that's in, in leadership, but it does mean that you have to respect him, and you need to behave just like a Christian. And the problem that I see in our world today, I don't know any Christians that are taking up arms and doing some crazy things that we see in the news, But what I do see is a lot of words that are being thrown around. I see it on Facebook and many other avenues of social media where people just got no problem whatsoever bad-mouthing the leadership in charge. And they're still going to do it regardless of this lesson. But the point is, is that are we behaving as Christians? Are we showing a good attitude? Are we showing righteousness in the world? And are we praying, let me say that again, are we praying for our leadership? And that's something that you need to be doing. Rather than bad-mouthing, you know, governments and whatnot on uh, Facebook, you need to be praying for them. And your prayers will say a lot. Mostly what it says is that you're relying upon God for his answers. And what it says as well is that when you pray for somebody, you, you know, you know, you know where they know where you stand um, in regard to your, your belief and your, and your teaching. Let's get back to uh, what government is there to do for us. Um, Obviously, you know, we pay taxes for, you know, a certain reason. We want to see some kind of result from that. And, uh, you know, government's there for our protection. Laws 
are for good and for justice. Uh, we have an element in society that doesn't want government to regulate every single thing. And I'll agree, there could be a problem with micromanaging sometimes. But when it comes down to it, uh, you know, we live in pretty good societies. We feel pretty well protected. Um, and a lot of times they can't stop crime, but they can certainly administer justice toward crime. But for the most part, this is to be a deterrent for men uh, to behave and do well. As the previous passage says, you know, government's there to praise those who do good. And verse 14 says, Or to governors or to those who are sent by them for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Laws are for our protection, they are for our good, and they are for justice. But I have to do my part as well. And in verse 15 says, For this is the will of God that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You know, we need to be loyal. Uh, We need to be good. We need to be a good citizen that's counted worthy. Uh, You know, a bad citizen can't be a good Christian. Let's just just make the spiritual connection right here. You know, a bad neighbor is not going to be looked at as a good example of a Christian person. And um, if, you know, you know, the Bible teaches us that we are to have a good testimony in the world. You can go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7 and look at the qualifications of the eldership and how they're to have a good reputation among men. And it doesn't mean that what we're doing is to be seen of men. Men are to see our good works to glorify God. That's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. But uh, we are to have a good testimony in the world. And if we're living as bad citizens and not respecting the ordination of the government, then we're not showing respect toward God. You know, how can we disrespect the authority of the world and then walk into a church building and say, oh, but I love God and I want to keep all his laws? And uh, people that sometimes disrespect authority have, well, they've got problem with rules. And if a person has a problem with rules, uh, then I don't see them getting very far in the kingdom of God as well. Well, you know, and we've got to remember, as verse 16 says, as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Remember that we are here to serve him. And when we serve God, well, it benefits everyone around us. As to God, that's the attitude that we need to have. Uh, Christians will benefit their community. Uh, Christians will benefit their neighborhoods. And of course, Christians benefit Uh, their workplace, and everywhere that they go as we try to be good members of society. Uh, When we looked at Israel and Judah in our recent studies in class at church uh, of their time in Babylon, uh, we're going to be studying about that for a long time as well. And you have a remnant of people that were trying to be godly in an unholy land. So whatever generation you live in, wherever, whatever parts of the world you might live in, you can be a Christian no matter where you go. Some places are going to be easier than others. But remember, you need to let your light shine. And your light shines brightest in a dark place. Some places of this world are darker than others. And sometimes we don't see the darkness because we think that sometimes evil is light. And remember, the devil portrays himself as an angel of light. So do not be deceived between what is right and what is wrong. The Bible teaches us certain qualities that we should have as Christians. And Paul said this back over in Romans 13, and Peter says it here in verse 17, to honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. All these things go hand in hand. And if we leave any one of these things out, then we're not truly honoring our God. We're not truly fearing our God if we disregard uh, the ordinance of government that he has put into place. We live in a democracy in the United States of America. We have the right to let our voices be heard through our votes. So do that. Uh, Let your voice be heard. But vote according to the scriptures as best as you can. But we can find people that will lead us at least in the right direction. That will give us the freedoms, the continued freedoms, to be able to continue to serve God, to give praise, honor, and glory to His name through worshiping together, through teaching and the preaching of His word. And um, you're going to find it will be a little bit tougher as time goes on as society tries to, you know, tighten its grip on on sinful thinking, uh, to make a hate crime out of preaching against things like homosexuality or abortion or many of the, of the other big issues that are out there. But we will let our voices be heard. We will let God's uh, word uh, shine throughout this world. So you quote scripture. You quote what the Bible has to say. 
and stand by God's Word. Well, thanks for listening today. If you'd like any further discussion on topics like this, please let us know. We'd be happy to study and uh, discuss these matters with you. We look forward to next week. Until then, may God bless you in your search for truth and reason.